So thus far, we have acquired two very important skills. The first skill we acquired was the ability to take an argument and find the conclusion, the analysis of an argument into premises and conclusion. The second skill we acquired was to be able to properly classify the argument that we're dealing with as either inductive or deductive. And we learn how to recognize the markers of induction and of deduction so that we can properly classify arguments. Now we're going to turn to the most important skill, which is argument evaluation. Being able to determine whether a given argument is a good one or a bad one is the most important skill that we can acquire, and it's crucial to our abilities as critical thinkers to be able to do this. Now, this is the most complex part of what we're trying to learn, and so in order to simplify things a little bit, I've broken this down into different presentations. This presentation will focus exclusively on inductive arguments and how to determine if they are quote unquote good or bad inductive arguments. In a separate presentation, I'll talk about deduction, which is a little bit more technical and a little bit more complex. Induction is a nice place to start because it's pretty intuitive and it's fairly easy to acquire at least a, a rough sense of how to evaluate inductive arguments. So let's start with a quick recap to refresh our memories. Inductive reasoning or an inductive argument is an argument where someone claims that a given set of premises makes a given conclusion probable or likely. Probability is the key identifying feature of inductive reasoning. And all of the various types of inductive arguments we looked at, predictions, historical claims, causal reasoning, analogies, arguments from authority, and so on, all have that feature where they present a certain piece of information or a certain set of premises from which then they conclude that a, con that a given conclusion is likely to be the case. So induction is about probability. So what we're going to be focusing on during this presentation is the question, well, when is the conclusion likely to be the case? When should I accept the conclusion? What are the standards I should keep in mind when someone claims that something follows with a certain degree of probability or likelihood? So during this presentation, we will learn the ideas of strength and weakness and how to gauge and weigh a given set of premises to determine if a conclusion is likely or not. And so, for example, here's, a, here's an illustration of an inductive argument. It's a prediction. The Padres won on Monday. The Padres won on Tuesday. The Padres won on Wednesday. So the Padres will probably win on Thursday. Notice that we're making a claim about what's going to happen on Thursday based on what happened on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The general rule of inductive reasoning is that the future tends to be like the past. So if something has been happening relatively consistently for a relatively long period of time, it is more likely than not that it will continue to happen. But notice it's not necessarily the case that it will continue to happen. The Padres winning consistently is an indicator that it is more likely that they will continue to win, but it's by no means necessary. So that's what makes this kind of reasoning inductive, is that idea of probability or likelihood. And our analysis of the preceding argument is summarized. Let's try it again. And the analysis of the preceding argument in general is summarized here. The, the argument about the Padres is inductive because it claims that a given conclusion follows to a degree of probability, not necessity, so it meets that minimum criterion of being a inductive argument. And since the conclusion is likely or probable, assuming the truth of the premises, we can conclude that this is a strong inductive argument. So let's look at a more formal definition of strength and weakness to see what we're going to be looking for when we're evaluating inductive arguments. The two evaluative concepts we're going to be using with inductive arguments are strength and weakness. We're going to start moving away from using the 
intuitive terms good and bad to talk about arguments because those are really not very helpful. Usually when someone says an argument is bad, that just means I don't like the conclusion, and that's really not relevant. Um, we're going to look at strength and weakness as properties of arguments and the relationship of premises to conclusion in an inductive argument. So uh, a inductive argument will be provisionally strong, that is, it passes the first level of evaluation when the conclusion is probably true if we assume the premises are true. So this is what I've been emphasizing so far in the Padres example illustrates this. A bad inductive argument is weak and that means the conclusion is probably false even if the premises were true. So what we're determining here is if we assume those premises are true, would the conclusion probably follow or not? If it would probably follow and probably be true, then it passes the first hurdle. It's a strong argument. It is provisionally treated as good, pending another level of testing, which we'll get into later. If it doesn't pass that test, meaning even if we assume the premises are true, the conclusion is probably not true, it's probably false, then it's a weak argument, and in that case, it's a bad argument. We can dismiss it. One point I really want to emphasize, because this is counterintuitive to a lot of people, is that when we're evaluating arguments, and this will be true of deductive arguments as well as inductive arguments, it doesn't matter whether the premises are actually true or false at the first level of evaluation. So to determine strength or weakness, we really don't care whether the premises are actually true or actually false statements. What we care about is, if we assume them to be true, would they support the conclusion? The key to keep in mind here is we're not evaluating the truth or falsity of the statements in an argument. Evaluating an argument means evaluating the inference in the argument. Do the premises support the conclusion or not? That's what we need to focus on. So shifting our focus to that takes a little bit of practice, and we will do that throughout the course of this and, and throughout our going through the exercises as well. So here's another example of an inductive argument. This is another simple argument. It rained on Monday. It rained on Tuesday. It rained on Wednesday. Today is Thursday. Conclusion, it is probably going to rain today. Now, of course, here in Southern California, it didn't rain on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. That really doesn't matter. If it had rained on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, that would seem to indicate that it's likely that it will also rain today. One of the basic rules of inductive reasoning to keep in mind, which will help guide you to determine whether an argument is strong or not, is the claim that the future tends to be like the past. Meaning, if something has happened very often in the past, it is more likely than not to continue to happen or happen again. And so in this example, since it's been raining a lot, it's likely to continue raining. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to rain, right? But it means it's probably going to rain, and that's what we need to have a strong inductive argument like this one is here. If those premises were true, that conclusion would be likely. Now I don't want to beat this point into the ground, but it really, really is important. So I do want to emphasize that you have to keep in mind we're not evaluating the statements in the argument we are evaluating the inference of the argument, meaning not whether or not the premises are true, but if we accepted the premises, would they support the conclusion? This is not the totality of evaluation. It's the first step. If the premises do in fact support the conclusion, it's a strong argument, and then we have to subject it to further scrutiny. But whether or not the statements in the argument at this first step are true or false really doesn't matter. However, there is one exception that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. So the one exception where the truth values of the statements in an argument are relevant to determining strength or weakness has to do in the case of a weak argument where you have actually true premises and an actually false conclusion. Now if you think about it, you can, you can evaluate this argument as being weak automatically 
because you have actually true premises and an actually false conclusion, which means, of course, if you assume the premises are true, the conclusion is probably false since it actually is. And so therefore, when you have just this one configuration of actual truth values, actually really true premises and a really false conclusion, you can conclude automatically that an argument is weak and then reject it. All other configurations of truth values really don't matter. This is the only one that we need to pay attention to, and I will emphasize this as we go through some of the exercises in those cases where it becomes relevant. Probably the trickiest thing about evaluating inductive arguments, at least when you're starting out, is learning to develop your judgment. Um, Strength is not an all-or-nothing property of inductive arguments. Strength is a matter of degree. An argument can be weak, somewhat weak, strong, very strong, extremely strong, depending on the degree of likelihood or probability to which the conclusion follows. And so evaluating this involves, in a matter of speaking, uh, using your experience and learning to develop your, your powers of judgment. It's different than deductive arguments, which we'll get into next week. Those are more mechanical, they're a little bit more technical, and they require more of a formal apparatus. Um, but with induction, you have to use your judgment. It's a matter of degree. Even though evaluating inductive arguments involves using your judgment and your experience, nevertheless, there are some simple rules of thumb you can follow to give you um, a little bit of a foundation in what to look for in an inductive argument. And so when we're looking for a strong argument, what we want to know is, is the conclusion more likely than not the case if the premises are true? And so to have a number to use in your judgment, think of 51% being the minimal threshold for a conclusion to be likely true. So the idea is, if a conclusion is 51% likely, if the premises are true, then it's a minimally strong argument. And the more likely it is, the higher that percentage, the stronger the argument is. So a conclusion that is 99% certain, if we assume the premises are true, is an extremely strong argument. And so strength is a spectrum from 51% likelihood up to 99.999% likelihood. Conversely, if an argument is 49% likely or lower, that means it's more improbable, and therefore it is a weak argument, even if the premises are true, the conclusion is unlikely. And with weakness, the lower that number, the lower the likelihood, the lower, the weaker the argument is. So an argument that is that has a conclusion that is 10% likely, even if we assume the premises are true, is an extremely weak argument. One important factor to keep in mind is that we often have to reevaluate our conclusions based on inductive reasoning because more information comes to light. It may have been the case that we made a decision that a conclusion is likely or unlikely based on certain information, but if that information was incomplete or flawed in some way, or more information comes to light, we might have to reevaluate and we might have to reach alternative conclusions. And this is why areas where inductive reasoning is very predominant, like in medicine or in science, you see constant revision of hypotheses because more information is constantly coming to light and we are refining our uh, judgments based on that new information. So you have to keep this in mind. The more information you have, or if more information comes to light, it might be necessary to revise your conclusions. Let's look at an example of uh, the kind of thing I'm talking about. So here's the kind of thing I'm talking about. These two arguments side by side are almost identical, but the second one has a little bit more information, but that really is important for reaching a, a conclusion. The first argument on the left-hand side says, the used car I am thinking of buying is only a year old. The car has low mileage, the engine has been well maintained, the car has been recently painted, therefore this is probably a good car for me to buy. Now, all other things being equal, just working with these premises as they stand on the screen here, this is, I would say, a, a pretty strong argument. Those are pretty good reasons for that conclusion to likely to be true. But notice the argument on the right-hand side. 
The first four premises are identical. The car is a year old, low mileage, well maintained, recently painted, but we also add the fact that the car was recently reported stolen in Arkansas. Now you can see that this additional piece of information should, I hope, cause us to revise the evaluation of this argument and now we would see that it's probably not a good idea to buy this car. So the argument has gone from strong to weak because more information has come to light. So this is part of the interesting aspect of inductive reasoning is that we constantly have to revise our results based on new information coming in. In summary, the major difference between inductive and deductive reasoning has to do with the fact that induction emphasizes probability, whether or not a conclusion is likely or unlikely based on certain information. And so evaluating that relationship between premises and conclusion is the crucial factor for determining whether an argument is weak or strong. As we'll see next week, this is very different than evaluating deductive arguments. Deductive arguments are more formal and mechanical, and the relationship between premises and conclusion is conceived of in a somewhat different way. When we're evaluating inductive arguments, we need to use our judgment. We have to evaluate the claims being made and ask ourselves, do those premises in fact make that conclusion likely or not? And again, this is going to involve using our judgment and our experiences and a little bit of practice. Okay, so now it's time to practice what we have learned. And in the module, you will find some exercises where I give you some inductive arguments and your task is to evaluate them to determine if they are strong or weak using the techniques we learned in this lesson. There will be an answer key provided so you can check your results. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to post your questions either in the questions forum or send me an email and I can reply with an explanation as well. Either way, hopefully you do well and let me know how things are going. And next we're going to turn to deductive validity, which is quite a bit more complex than inductive strength. So do your best to acquire the techniques of uh, evaluating inductive arguments before we move on to that next topic.